Not all religions are equal. Not all religions are equal. In our country today, we think that um, our country is the only one where you know, various progressive groups and political uh, ideal, ideologies uh, support the idea of uh, reinventing our history. And uh, you know, they're doing it by tearing down monuments uh, that honor past events and prominent historical figures uh, from the past. Seems to be happening a lot in this, uh, in this country of ours these days. We read about that all the time. It's always the big story. In Canada, where I come from, Lees and I uh, come from, the movement uh, or this movement has been going on for years. We think, oh, it's new. It's not new, it's been happening for years in, uh, in Canada. Uh, we just give it a different name in Canada. All of this has been going on under the banner of what is quaintly and innocently referred to as reasonable accommodation. That, that's, the, that's the catch word for you know, all this business. Same, same idea, changing history, changing cultural icons and all that business. So they call it uh, reasonable accommodation. And this battle is not focused on the, uh, in Canada that is, not focused on the past evil of slavery because here you know, this is the, the focus uh, and the impact of this uh, experience on the nation since there is no history of institutionalized slavery in Canada. It's not part of the history of that, of that nation. No, the field of battle in Canada is immigration policy and its effect on the nation. The uh, basic argument is about how much should Canadians, Canadian citizens, how much should Canadian citizens accommodate newly arrived immigrants when it comes to culture and religion? For example, a man from India uh, who practiced the Sikh religion, uh, he joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, and he went through the training and all that business. But when the graduation ceremony came, you know, at the end of boot camp, you know, and he was going to be officially a, a Mountie, um, he refused to wear the cover or the hat, you know, like they wear, you know, troopers, state troopers wear those kind of hats. Well, the Mounties in Canada, they wear the same kind of hats. Well, this individual, no, he didn't, he didn't want to wear that hat because that was disrespectful to his own culture. What he wanted to wear was a turban. He wanted to wear a turban according to his religion not the RCMP, you know, what, it's a 150, 200 year old institution. They've been wearing the same uniform for two centuries, but no, he didn't want to wear that hat. No, sir. And so the case went to the Canadian Supreme Court and the Indian recruit won the right to wear a turban as a Mountie and to wear a turban for his graduation. The court, the Supreme Court said that this was, listen, this was a reasonable accommodation of his culture and his religion. You, you get the point, you get the battle. The battle was, should we accommodate this man and the fact that he didn't want to wear the traditional RCMP hat, he wanted to wear his, was that a reasonable request that he was making? And the Supreme Court decided, well, yeah, that's a reasonable thing. So they made an exception for him and of course, anyone else who decided to do that. In another case, just to make sure you're understanding what's going on here, in another case, a woman sued the government for her right to wear a burqa. In other words, a full body, full face covering according to her religion when she voted, because the law says 
you know, when you go vote in person, you have to be able to identify yourself. And her argument was, uh, well, that doesn't go with my religion. My religion says I ought to be wearing this, this particular uh, outfit, outfit. And of course, same thing, this thing dragged on, and I remember it, I was in Canada when this happened. Uh, this thing dragged on the court, so I went all the way to the Supreme Court, and when the decision came down, they said, you know what? That's a reasonable accommodation, and so she was permitted uh, to wear a full burqa uh, in order to uh, go vote. I see the same kind of thing happening here in the area of religion. As people, you know, they sue the government or they protest the presence of religious symbols in schools and in public places because it offends their personal beliefs or their lack of belief, or their misunderstanding about the separation between a church and state. Of course, the thinking behind all of, uh, you know, all of these uh, efforts and debates in both Canada and the United States is the same. The new argument, which ignores what the Constitution actually says about the Christian religion goes something like this. Since all religions are the same and they all have equal value, then no one religion should receive preferential treatment. Therefore, all religions should be accommodated or discarded either, either way, it makes no difference. Now, in answer to this type of secular pluralism, and that's what this is, that's secular pluralism. In answer to this secular pluralism and the argument for it, we as Christians, or we, have two responses. One, the politicians use, and one that is politically incorrect, but closer to the truth. So here are the two arguments. Number one, the first argument is based on history. In order to keep Judeo-Christian symbols in public places, things like crucifixes or the Ten Commandments or nativity scenes at Christmas time, so on and so forth, the politicians say that these are important symbols of our history and our culture. You know, the Judeo-Christian mindset is an important part of our, of our history, of this nation. That's why we allow these symbols. They argue that the U, uh, United States was founded on Christian principles based in the Bible, and these symbols reflect that reality. Well, this argument still works today, but as more and more uh, people from other countries, from other non-Christian countries, arrive in this nation, uh, we have to understand that in the future, some may use this point to argue for the inclusion of more uh, Buddhist symbols or more Muslim symbols publicly, or other types of symbols in public life that reflect the changing face of America. If we're saying, hey, we've got a lot of people here who are Christians, so we should have the crucifixes, we should have the nativity scene. Well, you know, in 10 years from now, people are going to say, well, listen, you know, we have a lot of people who are from Muslim countries, so we should have some Muslim symbols or Hindu symbols, because we have a lot more people coming from those nations. You know, the argument cuts both ways here, okay? Or as this nation becomes less religion, less religious, rather, and as it becomes more secular, then why don't we just get rid of all religion, especially Christianity, because less people believe and it's a religion, and here's the new twist, it's a religion that is guilty of oppression and racism. That's the new twist in our generation. Christianity never in the past was accused of being racist and oppressive, but today, 
this is the argument. So that's the first argument that politicians use to defend you know, the use of Christian symbols and so on and so forth in society. It's part of our history, we ought to be able to do it. There is the second argument, this other uh, argument um, uh, that will never be overcome by debates or immigration or law is very powerful, but it is politically incorrect. So very few politicians ever use it, but I'm not a politician, so I want to use it. This second argument is that Christianity as a religious system is superior to other religions. That's why we have it, that's why we use it. In other words, not all religions are equal, and of all the religions throughout history, Christianity is by far the very best of religions when examined objectively, side by side, next to other religions. This is why we should keep and promote its symbols, especially in our government and schools and public places. Of course, this view doesn't promote reasonable accommodation or easy relationships with non-Christians or social progressives. But Jesus said that he didn't come to earth in order to bring peace and safety between men, but rather he came to bring a sword. He said, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. If Jesus said that division in one's own home and family would occur over belief in him, imagine what would happen in society in general. You know, Christians were, you know, in this generation, brothers and sisters, you know, the, the, the idea is that we got to get along, you know, we got to go along to get along. That, that, that's okay if you're a politician, you know, you got to go along to get along. That has never been the way that we approach our faith. Who ever heard of that nonsense? We all, we've got we've to go along with the world and so on and so forth in order to get along and, and, and we mustn't rock the boat. Reasonable accommodation is the world's way of reconciling different cultures and different religions. It is the world's way of stripping away any differences between us and neutralizing religious power and zeal. Let's face it, if all religions are the same, then none have real value, and that includes Christianity. What they don't realize is that it is Christianity that has made this country what it is, and reducing its influence by making it equal to all others will eventually lead to the ruin of this nation. You see, people from non-Christian countries come here from all over the world to share in the advantages of this nation, but they don't realize many times that it is Christianity that has given this country its greatness, not Islam, not Hinduism, not Buddhism, not atheism, not ruralism, not secularism, not progressivism. All of those isms has not been the source of the greatness of America. They may be trying to change it, but they are not the source of its greatness. You know, even the idea of tolerance and uh, uh, accommodation, the idea of fairness and hospitality to strangers, all of these come from the Judeo-Christian heritage that built this country. 
You ever notice that there are not too many people trying to emigrate to Iran? How long do you think the line is at the uh, 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 embassy of, of Afghanistan for people to go and live there? Anybody ready to switch your American passport for a Somalian passport? Anybody want to go live in China? Anybody want to go live in Tibet? How about India? How about Pakistan? No big lineups at these embassies. I'm not being mean. I'm just stating a fact. What I'm saying is that when we compare religions, we see that some are just better. They're more positively productive than other religions. And of all of these, Christianity scores the highest. We need to know this, and we need to know why this is true. And so this evening, I'd like to give you three historical reasons why Christianity is superior. I mean, you can, you know, you can brag and blow all you want, but you have to have, you have to back it up. So let's back it up, shall we? Three ways that Christianity has provided a better social foundation than any other religion. Now in his book, What's So Great About Christianity, author Dinesh D'Souza reviews how Christianity provided the basis for what is best in Western civilization. He mentions three areas where Christianity has been responsible for the advancement of society for the better throughout history. First, he mentions betterment in the area of science. You know, one of the main attacks against Christianity all the time is that it's anti-science, it's myth. You know, you people believe in myths, you believe in fairy tales. But the opposite is what is true. The greatest breakthroughs in science came about because of Christian basic concepts. His point is that Christians were the first to envision the universe as following laws that reflected the rationality of God the creator. These thinkers reasoned that these laws were accessible to man because man is created in the image of God and shares in that spark of divine reason. The first universities, the first research establishments were started and sponsored by Christian churches for this reason. In other words, because Christians believed in an intelligent God who created the universe and blessed man with knowledge and the ability to reason, they set about by faith to decode and discover what God had created. In other words, believers in God realized that what God had made was discoverable. It had laws, it had things that you could discover and use with clarity. The greatest scientists in the West who are responsible for the greatest discoveries from Copernicus and Kepler, Galileo to Pasteur, Mendel and the Le Maître, uh, all of these were uh, Christian uh, scientists, Christian thinkers. Even the head of the Human Genome Project, Francis Collins, who led the team that mapped out the entire human DNA, some say the greatest feat of modern science, he himself is a devout Christian. Another area that Christianity has served society, and that is in the area of social justice. Isn't that kind of ironic? Today, you know, in the name of social justice, people are going about trying to tear down all the symbols of our past in the name of social justice. In the name of social justice, people are going around burning down cities, trying to destroy the established order, all in the name of social justice. But true social justice 
is what has come from uh, Christian thinkers. The preciousness and equal worth of every human life, that's a Christian idea. I mean, because we are created in the image of God, we are all equally valuable to God and society. Where do you think that idea comes from? You know, the, the Greeks and the Romans, they had no such notions in their societies, which were built on slavery and conquest. Although Christianity tolerated slavery as a social evil at first, it was through the efforts of Christians that modern slavery was abolished in the West. It continues to exist today and it flourishes. However, it does so in non-Christian countries. Add to this the concepts of caring for the poor and the aged and the orphaned and widowed and people who are handicapped, all Christian ideas. These ideas grew out of Christianity's teaching to love your neighbor as yourself and to forgive your enemy. Who's got that concept in their religion that we're supposed to forgive our enemies? Which religion has got that as a, as a banner? The benevolence work of Christian churches was the forerunner of all government social services and programs of the modern era. Uh, growing up Catholic in Quebec, you know, in the 50s, in the 50s, all hospitals, all of them, had been built by the Catholic Church. All the orphanages had been built by the Catholic Church. All the soup kitchens, all the, uh, uh, you know, the care of widows and all that, that was all the Catholic Church. The government wasn't doing any of those things, not back in the 40s and 50s. The church, when I mean the church, Christian ideals is what moved people to begin helping uh, the less fortunate in society. Why? Because that's what their beliefs taught them to do. Until Christianity uh, came along, uh, the weak and the poor were enslaved, not cared for, and the sick and the orphaned, they were just left to die. You had several children, you had three children, then you, your fourth child was a girl. Oh, what do we do with those? Well, we leave them out in the field. In those days, they didn't know what you were going to have ahead of time. You know, back in the first century, you didn't know till the child was born. A girl? Yeah, no, we just... One of the features of early Christianity that brought it to the attention of that society was the fact that they would find these babies who were just left to die and they would quote adopt. Today adoption means you know, $35,000, a lot of meetings and so on and so forth. But back in the first century you found an abandoned child, you took it into your home. Why? Because that child was made in the image of God. And where did you learn that? Well you learned that from your Christian faith. And then Christianity was also the basis for, um, there we go, better, the basis for human rights laws. Again, people marching in the, I've never understood how human rights was, uh, is established by burning down somebody's business, but you know, who am I to judge? The modern notion of human rights, the right to freedom of conscience, the right to own property, the right to marry who you want to marry, the right to be treated equally before the law. These and other notions enshrined in many Western nations' bill of human rights or human rights declarations are all based on the teachings of Christianity. The premise is that all human life has equal dignity because it is created in the image of God and all will be judged by God's word. Some religions have some of these ideas, but Christianity was the first to present these ideas in their fullness. Of course, many religions 
don't have these ideas and the nations where they exist has societies that are repressed with much suffering. I, I, you know, I, you, you know this, but I, I've been to Haiti, you know, uh, uh, to, not as a tourist, but I've been there to preach and to travel around and, 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 and you know, visit villages and so on and so forth uh, with Jean Almira, our missionary. He drove me around, I was there for 10 days. And I witnessed firsthand a society that had consumed paganism in the, in the name of voodooism for 200 years. I observed firsthand the society that that concept of religion produced over a couple of centuries. And when I would ask Jean Elmira, what, it's so hopeless, there's such poverty, there's such corruption, it's just, it's hopeless, how do you, you know, how do you do it? And he said, the, you know, here we say it, you know, well, our only hope is Jesus while we're living in our several hundred thousand dollar valued homes, you know. But over there, he said, the only hope this nation has is Jesus. He says, I'm preaching the gospel. We're establishing schools where these children are going to learn Christianity because I know that after I die and after the people that I've taught die, finally Christianity will take hold and this nation will have a chance, but not before. Now I could go on and, and give you other reasons why Christianity is not just another religion, why it is not equal to others, but better than others. Just a couple of quick facts. The fact that it has better system of revelation contained in the Bible and access to God's word. No other religion has that. The fact that it's, there we go, the fact that it's leader and principal teacher is God himself in the form of Jesus, proven divine by his resurrection. No other religion has a resurrected leader. You want to go visit the, Every time you want to go visit the leader and, or the founder of another religion, you've got to go to a cemetery. Christianity is the only religion whose leader from not just generation to generation, but from century to century is the same living person, Jesus Christ. The fact that the method that Christianity offers to save man from death and condemnation is far, far superior than any other concept in any religion or philosophy. I've said this before, do we not realize that every other religion that exists today, their method of salvation is based on law. You got to do something, name the religion and I'll tell you what you got to do in order to be whatever it is that they see as being saved. But in every other religion except Christianity, you got to do something. Only Christianity is the religion where God in heaven reaches down and finds you and brings you up to his level. Every other religion, you've got to climb your way up. How about the fact that the promises made to Christians are more valuable and worthy of our devotion than anything else that anyone has or will ever offer now or in the future? Some religions your salvation is that you disappear, period. You're absorbed into the great being. But the you, you know, your conscious self, it disappears, it's extinguished, it's gone. It's absorbed into the greater. In Christianity, you remain who you are, except you're exalted, except you're glorified but you know who you are. You have consciousness of self. 
I mean, I could talk about these, but you've already heard some of these arguments in sermons and lessons here and in other places. So I'll stick to the three basic reasons given by author Dinesh D'Souza arguing that Christianity has provided a better social foundation to Western civilization than any other religion. Very quickly as a review. A theological foundation that encouraged reasonable inquiry as the method to discover the vastness and the beauty of God's creation. We have the best theological foundation to know not only about God, but to know about what God has done. Secondly, a basis of social consciousness that promoted defense and assistance to the weak and poor based on the Christian virtue of love. Has any other religion develop the concept of love to a higher, more exalted form than the Christian religion? And then of course, a framework of social justice that evolved into human rights laws supported by the notion that all were equally valuable before God and, and should be valuable in society in the same way. This is how Christianity was instrumental in establishing the Western society we live in. Brothers and sisters, people of different colors, you know, you can't legislate anybody to love somebody else. You can't make a law that will make a human being want to love another human being. There's no law that Congress or Senate can produce that will make a black person love a white person or a white person love a brown person or a brown person love a red person. There's no law that you can put on the books that will make somebody want to do that. Only the gospel can do that, why? Because through the gospel, God gives each individual, black, white, red, whatever, each individual receives the Holy Spirit of God. And it's the Holy Spirit of God that enables us to want to love our neighbor. That can't be legislated. It can only be given by God. No other religion has done these things for our country. And no other religion has enabled another nation to accomplish as much to the betterment of its people anywhere else. That's why not all religions are equal when measured carefully so they don't produce the same results. So when people want to come to the United States, what they really want is not just a better life, they want the life that Christianity has produced in this nation whether they realize that or not. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for Christianity, there would be no concept of freedom of religion, which non-Christian immigrants feel so strongly about. It's Christianity that has provided that freedom so that everyone can worship in good conscience. So what's my point here? I, I'm not denouncing other religions. I'm not criticizing the government. I'm not even saying that we shouldn't welcome immigrants. I'm, I'm an immigrant. Uh, after all, we're all immigrants. Some just arrived earlier than others. I'm saying that what has made the United States great is in large part due to its Christian heritage and foundation. If we remove this foundation, to make this a secular country, or we reduce Christianity to the level of every other religion, you will remove what made this nation what is, and it will cease to be. Brothers and sisters, you can't have a Christian nation by ripping out the Christian foundation upon which it stands. That's Satan. That's his work. 
They all want to stay in power and they'll do what it takes to win votes. I mean, even uh, disengaging us from the Christian heritage that made us who we are as a nation. As a Christian, however, there are some things that I can do. There are some things that I, that I must do. First of all, I must not be ashamed. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We, we need to stop uh, having an inferiority complex concerning our faith. Peter said that Christ is the only name under heaven by which men can be saved, Acts chapter four, verse 12. We need to become confident and bold in not only declaring that we are Christians, but also encouraging others to believe as well. We have something to offer. We have the very best thing to offer actually, and that is eternal life to Jesus Christ. Nobody else has this. Who else is offering that except Christians. And so let's not be ashamed. I, I, I don't apologize to anybody for being a Christian. Amen. I got no excuse to make to you. I don't mean you, I mean I'm talking to the world. I had no excuse to make to the world because I believe in Jesus. Secondly, we must not give a poor example. One thing I admire about Muslim women is their desire to give a good example as far as dress and conduct is concerned. I don't think you'll see a woman wearing a hijab, you know, rocking out in some nightclub till 2 a.m. It's not an image that you would imagine. But I know of some Christian young women who do that, even in this congregation. I admire you know, Sikh, the men with the turban, they wear a, a sword and so on and so forth, that's a Sikh religion. I admire Sikh men's commitment to their religious heritage by wearing a turban and allowing their hair to grow long underneath it. It's inconvenient, it's hot. But I've never witnessed a Sikh man guzzling a beer and dragging on a smoke on his porch. I've never seen that. This is not to say that I agree with their religion, I don't. But isn't it curious that people who follow lesser religions manage to give a better witness for their faith than many Christians do for a religion that promises so much more? Many don't believe in Christ or his power because of the weak or inconsistent example of his followers. God allowed foreign nations and foreign religions to take over Israel when she became sinful and unspiritual. There's no reason he wouldn't let that happen here as well. You wonder sometime, what's going on with this nation? You think God has nothing to do with what's been going on here? If the Christians don't live holy, committed lives, then who will speak for Christ? Surely not the government. Surely not the academics in our university. I mean, recently Harvard University has invested a million dollars for research to disprove the existence of God. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And surely not the hundreds of thousands of non-Christians who arrive here from foreign lands every single year. Instead of being afraid of them or despising their religion, we should be winning them to Christ with our love and with our good example. And so we must not be ashamed. We, we must give a good example and of course, we must stand firm. If anything I've said here this evening has something to do with what all of us are experiencing in our society today, this third point is it. We must stand firm. Peter says, 
uh, through Silvanus, our, fa our faithful brother, uh, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. You know, some people say to me, what are we going to do? Stand firm, that's doing something. Peter was writing to Christians who were living at a time of persecution and disbelief and wickedness and social immorality. I don't know, that sounds familiar. I can apply those words to our life today. We could also add social unrest. We could also add social insecurity. Note that he doesn't say, so therefore I want you to go and march in the street. Or go start a revolution. Or attack the government. No, he says stand firm in the grace of God. Our task is not to eliminate evil or disbelief or other religions. Our task is to stand firm, to be steady, to not be moved in our own faith. God is in control. God will preserve. God will save us if we do. There's been a lot of talk about church, you know. We've had a shutdown for months and we've had an irregular schedule and you know, social distance and canceled Sunday school. And there's been talk of, man, you know, I don't know if the church is going to survive and how are we going to do it and so on and so forth. Uh, brothers and sisters, the church doesn't belong to us. The church belongs to Christ. If he chooses for us to stand, we will stand. We will survive. Everything around us can burn to the ground. But if he chooses to do so, he will make a stand. But we have to choose to stand firm. If five people, only five people showed up tonight for services, they would have gotten this sermon. If 5,000 people showed up for services, they would have gotten this sermon. No matter what happens, I know what my job is. Sometimes it's a little easier to do, sometimes it's more difficult to do. But I know what my job is. Do you? Do you know what your job is as a Christian? Peter says it. Stand firm. And today in our generation, in our lives, this is where we stand firm, here. We're, we're not responsible for China. We're not responsible for Europe or for Africa, not even the entire USA or all of Oklahoma City. We're responsible for this place right here. This is where we stand firm. We stand firm in our worship to the Lord. We stand firm in our service. We stand firm in our holy living as a witness of our faith to those immediately uh, around us. The Muslims or Hindus uh, or even the atheists in other countries may not be influenced by us, but the people who live in Choctaw will and the disbelievers in Hera and those who are in Midwest cities, they will if we stand firm in our faith right here where God has planted us, it begins and it ends right here. The life and the growth and the effect of this congregation is the witness to our community that Christianity is not just another religion, but as Paul says, it is the power of God for all those who believe. And so as I said to you previously, what am I to do, Lord? The world, you know, is, is falling apart. The answer is, stand firm, my son. Stand firm, you young man. Stand firm, you older sister. Stand firm, you young woman. Stand firm, young Christian. Stand firm, 
50, 60, 70 year Christian, stand firm. That's our job. Let's make sure that we do that. Amen. If you need to take a position, and take a position I mean, if you need to confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're ready to turn your life around, to repent, and you're ready to be buried with him in the waters of baptism, well then we encourage, we encourage you to do that tonight. And the rest of us, if we need help and prayer to stand firm, then our elders are here to pray with you and to encourage you in the spirit so that you might stand firm against the slings and arrows of the evil one and all the machinations going on in government and society today. If you remember nothing else that I've said tonight, remember my job is to stand firm. Shall we stand and sing now the song of invitation?